we are back. This is episode number 22 of the Shutdown Inning Podcast. I'm Steven Risotto, and joined with me, as always, is the great legendary Tyler Hall. Tyler, what's going on? <laughs> hey, hey, Steven. Hey, everybody. Yeah, it's good to be back, man. It's been a few weeks. I know you particularly have been busy finishing junior year. How, how'd that go, man? Finals go smooth? Yeah, junior year was a grind. Finals went pretty smooth. And the good thing about finals is a lot of them were projects. And we pretty much had the whole month of May to do them. And the good news for me is one of them was a newspaper layout that I I have experienced doing layout. But honestly, I get giddy anything journalism related. And thankfully, most of my classes are journalism related. So um, finals went good. I'm a senior. Um, now growing growing up so fast i know right in front of our eyes doesn't it get you emotional a little bit oh man totally but then also I, I mean we haven't really <laughs> mentioned your other projects aside from you calling this podcast that podcast but you've also been i want to make sure it, it, most people listening probably know about rizzo cast but you've been crushing it there the last few weeks too you've had what kyle blanks mccovey cove dave and larry boa what a what a you know Three yeah. up, three down. There we go. Yeah, th- quite the lineup. And hopefully we could get some of those guys on here too. We are we're getting ready to have another guest pretty soon. But um, RizzoCast did nothing in April. I was very busy in April. And I figured I got to have like a hot week. So that's kind of what I did. I just kind of went wild with sending requests out. And we touched on three very different topics in those, in yeah, those I mean, episodes. Yeah. I listened to all your episodes, but it was I listened to all, all three and, and for everybody. You know, you did cover a lot of topics. Your the, our Giants fans listeners definitely check out the McCovey Cove Dave episode. That was a fun one. And then uh Blanks had a lot of interesting stuff to say. And then obviously, you know, Larry Boa has a great history in the game and he touched you you made sure to touch on a lot of that with him. So awesome uh there. And and now we're back at the shutdown inning. So here we yeah. go. Yeah, it's almost like there's like two different dimensions of my podcasting life, but um, this one, this one, I value it quite a bit, Tyler. <laughs> oh. Doesn't make you tear up a little bit? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we, we did mention that like we hadn't done this. It's been about 20 days, but um, the baseball world did lose someone very significant um, in kind of our absence, and it was left-hander Vita Blue. Uh, who was a just a Bay Area legend. He pitched a lot of years for those championship teams in the early 70s for the Oakland A's. Then later in his career, he bounced around and uh, was with the Giants for a few different stints. Uh, Invited Blue passed away uh, at the age of 73 um, on, on May 6th. So, um, I mean, any any kind of connection that you have with Vita? I know you're very active in the Giants world and have you had any interaction with him? Have you met him? No, I never, I never did. I never met him, but you know, one thing about, you know, Bay area and especially, you know, the giants and their broadcasters or their, you know, teams on broadcast is you, you just feel like you get to know them. And so we've all seen Vida on, on TV a lot. And uh, so it always kind of sucks when someone passes away. Cause that's when you really take a chance to appreciate it instead of, you know, while they're still here and seeing some of the stats, and you don't realize how impressive his career was until you can go back and kind of look at it as a whole and have a, a spotlight shown on it. I mean, he won an MVP and, you know, and a Cy Young. I know that's only happened a few other times in baseball history. As you mentioned, he anchored three World Series teams in Oakland. I mean, uh, and just, you know, it's always another part that, that obviously is, is unfortunate with people passing uh, is people reflecting on it. And there were there's so many awesome posts uh from bay area baseball you know legends themselves you know from you know you name it and there was uh they were posting you know their memories of vida there was some good ones from i saw one from barry one from renell you know he was just everyone that that met that was fortunate enough to meet him just really seemed to love him yeah and like the thing that i was thinking about when this happened was like has there ever been anybody that has played for the giants and the a's that have been that has been more beloved than Vita Blue. Like I can't think of anybody. Um, yeah, I mean, like yeah, I mean, playing wise, you, you probably think of him more as an A. But I mean, he had an impact on both. Where there's some mm-hmm. guys who, you know, they were an A and then they finished with the Giants or vice versa. 
And so you really think of them as, you know, definitely one of one or the, one of the two. And while Vida was obviously more success on the field as an A, you know, he had a big connection to a lot of Giants fans too. Yeah. And he had a career in broadcasting too. And I think people gravitate towards the broadcasting part of it significantly. He did some radio shows, he did pre and post, but, uh, and also fun fact that I saw, and this is like your classic, I don't, you've probably heard this, but the classic trivia question, Vita Blue is the last switch hitter to win the MVP in the American League. So that's a fun stat. <laughs> and also like his numbers right. in that, that Cy Young MVP year is absurd. 21 years old. Oh yeah. Um, and he had a, a sub two ERA at 1.82. 312 innings pitched that's insanity and it, he only yeah that's insane 301 strikeouts um like there's let, some teams this year who if you add their top two pitchers together they won't throw that many innings not even close yep not even close and he led the league in like everything fip whip hits per nine k's per nine um, just everything and and listening to like Kruko and Kuiper talk about um, Vita Blue they just said like blazing fastball way ahead of his time with this fastball and the way he used it so um, yeah rest in peace Vita Blue definitely uh, a good one and a sad sad time for uh, for the uh, Bay Area sports and he's a Bay Area sports Hall of Famer too so R.I.P. Um and kind of jump into, you know, what's going on around the league. Um, I mean, we we're talking about like what's going on in, in these teams. I mean, there's some weird trends going on right now with teams that are either like one division is all good. One division is all bad. Teams are underperforming left and right. Teams are overperforming left and right. It's just like one big whirlpool right now of craziness in baseball. Yeah, I mean, you and I were kind of look, just looking at the standings together before we started. And like you know, like you mentioned, every team in the AL East still over 500. We talked about that a little bit last episode. All of them have a positive run differential. Uh, you know, the the last place Blue Jays would be at least at first or tied for first in at least another division in the AL Central, and they're in last place. <laughs> It's insane. I mean, like, I don't even know what to think about. And I wonder how much the balanced schedule has changed some things. Cause like, you know, it, it, I don't know. I don't know if like the, the lack of in division games are making these divisions more intriguing, I mean, it, but it I like definitely it. Make, yeah. I mean, it definitely, you get to see how they're performing against baseball as a whole more now, instead of just against their division. So, I mean, instead of the, you know, the AL East, banging up on each other for probably at least a, an extra three or four series by this point against each other. They're beaten up on other divisions. And then where, you know, in like a division like the central where they're all just kind of, you know, not really separating themselves, you know, the top two or so teams there would probably be having a couple extra wins. So they're uh, get playing against the lower end of that division. So their ceiling is now lower too. So it's, you're definitely seeing, you know, where the the cream of the crop in baseball is with this balanced schedule. I think. Yeah, and and we talked a little bit about you know in prior episodes about how good the Diamondbacks, how nice of a story the Diamondbacks were, and still they're still a good amount above 500. Um, but the Dodgers have kind of found their stride too. And by the way, the Padres, we'll get to them in a bit. But you know, yeah, we'll get to them in a bit. But the Dodgers, they have their ace going down. Julio Arias has been uh, has been placed on the injured list. Um, not something the uh, the Dodgers want to hear. And Dustin May, by the way, I didn't mention this, but yeah. he's also going on the injured list with an elbow injury. Um, and like two uh, or three days, two or three days apart from each other, they both hit the IL. Yeah. So I mean, just not not great news for. Uh, and I didn't. I should have checked this before, but. Do you know what it is with Arias? Why he's uh, what the injury I... is? <laughs> I, I guess I should have looked into this before, but um, it is a hamstring injury. Ooh. So. Yeah, I mean those those can linger. So those are especially you know with the Dodgers starting to kind of play up to their potential. Uh, and how hamstrings can linger, I would think that they'll probably let Urias spend an extra, uh, at least turn through the rotation on the IL, make sure he's 
good and right before they bring him back because you don't that's that's one of the you never want to come back early from an injury but that's one that can just keep barking on you for a whole year if you don't take care of it right the first time yeah absolutely and he's a pending free agent like he's like the only like free agent that might be worth pursuing for one of those big contracts coming up yeah. um and, and yeah was... i mean when you said bad news for the dodgers mm-hmm. one of my, in, in my head i was like bad news for urias too because you know he wants to be able to show that he can stay healthy and, and pitch a full season before he goes and asks for, you know, a nine figure contract. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the Dodgers countered that move. They they're, you know, calling up one of their top prospects before 2023, Bobby Miller, who's a right-hander was ranked number 21 by baseball America, number 24 by major league baseball and number 27 by baseball prospectus in the game in terms of top prospects. So if you even that out, that's one of the top 10 right-handed pitchers um, on those prospect lists. So Bobby Miller getting called up, um, who is a just a hard thrower, good stuff, struggled in, in four starts in Oklahoma City to start the year in AAA, but had a good outing in five innings, giving up one earned run um, in his first start of the year. But, um, you know, I guess it's about that time where the Dodgers call someone up, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just nuts how they've maintained such a, a successful major league team while not really sacrificing the farm. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, just, you know, it, it, it's a giant fan. It infuriates me every year when I look at the prospect rankings and see the Dodgers are usually like at worst, they're like third in baseball for their farm system. And, you know, a lot of the, the trades they've made in the past few years, and you look at, you know, the prospects they give up and where they're ranked, it's, they find a way to make these deals to make their major league team better without giving up their top guys. Mm-hmm. And it gives them this incredible depth that they're uh, fortunate to call on. Yeah. And San Diego has kind of done the opposite, right? They've like, have you seen those homegrown lists where like the Padres are always last? Because they just don't have any homegrown players and they don't have a farm system right now because it's all gone. But like the Dodgers, like James Outman is another one, the Redwood City kid who yeah. uh, attended Sarah High School. He's having a really good year with an 830 OPS. And um, yeah, the, the Dodgers have hit their stride, but um, Arias hitting the IL, we'll see what kind of effect it has with their pitching. Um, and if Bobby Miller pitches good, maybe not a huge effect. Um, and I guess staying in the division, um, there's a story that came out and just to mention, we did touch on this a few episodes back when the Diamondbacks pulled the trigger and DFA Madison Bumgarner. He's since been released since we last checked in, but there is a kind of riveting article that came out about how he was unwilling to listen to his pitching coaches and ended up not having a relationship with them by the time he was DFA'd. So the Giants, uh, the Diamondbacks had a pitching strategist named Dan Heron, who pitched in the big leagues for a long time and they bopped heads and they didn't, they weren't on speaking terms apparently. So Baumgartner was unwilling to change the way he pitches and he gets released. Yeah. I mean, that's unfortunate to like hear that kind of stuff come out, especially, you know, for where we're from and, and how, a uh, high, you know, light we we keep uh, on Mad Bum, but I, I, to be honest, I'm not too surprised that he wanted to just do it his way, and eventually that does catch up to you, especially if you're not willing to make any adjustments and kind of change your approach as you go, and you don't have the stuff that you used to. But I mean, I can only imagine he's got quite a quite a bit of an ego with everything that he's accomplished, and probably thinks that he knows better than any of his coaches, especially, you know, if you have a guy who Dan Heron had a great career, but he doesn't have the accolades of Mad Bum. So like, I could just see Bumgarner going, what are you going to teach me? Like, you know, so it's unfortunate, man. Uh, yeah, what, yeah. What, what what was your thoughts when you saw that come out? Yeah, well, the article, if, if anybody wants to read it out there, it's on The Athletic. And I just thought the whole thing, I tweeted that I thought it was intriguing. And I do think it's intriguing because I do see both sides of it. And it does, like, first and foremost, just to preface it by saying, Madison Bumgarner is one of the fiercest competitors that I have ever seen take the field. Uh, We have seen it. We have seen him not be afraid of the big moment in the postseason numerous times. And he's one of the best performers under pressure Maybe in baseball, you know, he's on the short list in terms of postseason performers in October. 
Um, however, this, you know, this to me is not sitting right. Um, and it, it's shocking a little bit. I wouldn't say shocking, but it's surprising that a guy with such a winning mentality um, and a winning track record could, you know, be, I don't want to say a loser. That might be harsh, but for the content purpose of this, be such a loser in this situation with yeah. like very selfish tendencies. And I, I do, I do feel for him because I do think it's sad seeing him be in denial of his own decline. Like he thinks that he could still pitch the same way, but he doesn't understand that his velocity is a lot worse. His stuff's a lot worse and guys are doing different things each and every, each and every year to get better. Um, but we've also seen guys try and reinvent themselves when this happens, right? CC Sabathia, prime example, learn how to pitch. Felix Hernandez, kind of in the same predicament as Bumgarner, a guy who came up really young, had mileage on his arm, and then had to figure out how to be more of a, you know, finesse guy. Okay. Yeah. And for Madison Bumgarner not to, I don't want to say see writing on the wall because nobody's prepared for when they start sucking in their career ever. I don't care how many times you admit it. Like when it hits, yeah. it hits like a rock. Um, and what I mean by losing a mentality is like, you know, it's adapt or die in baseball. And people are constantly making adjustments. And if you're not keeping up with the adjustments, I'm sorry, you're a loser. Like that's the whole point of yeah. baseball is to keep in sports and life in general, to keep up with the times, make adjustments to be successful. And if you don't want to do it for your own pride, fine. But there's 25 other guys that depend on you and expect you to perform good because you're a high paid player and essentially leaving them in the dust is not going to do anything. OK, so I know that's kind of a mini rant right there, yeah. but karma catches up and it is sad. But at the same yeah, time, I mean, you yeah. know, like, you know, like you mentioned, he's got, you know, or he had such a winning mentality that, you know, that the great players who get the longevity they they just want to do whatever they have to do to stay great exactly and whether that is you know changing their approach or you know ch you know changing their role on a team or, or whatnot you know they they make those adjustments and so it sucks when you know ego takes hold over that drive to win because they don't always go hand in hand and when we you follow your ego that's unfortunately what's going to happen more times than not yeah, and just like think of a great player in the history of baseball, a great player, like great, like all time immortal player. They made adjustments, every single one of them. Like Willie Mays is the one that I think of. I just got done reading John Shea's book, the the twenty four, which is amazing, by the way. I, I don't know why it took so long to read, but Willie Mays had to reconstruct his swing to fit Candlestick Park. He had to start going to right center. He had to start going oppo. Okay, those are the type of adjustments guys make. Like they see it. They see what they need to do. And yeah. I don't know. It's just, it just comes off as selfish and it comes off as, you know, if it's a, if it's an individual sport where you, where you're allowed to be selfish and you have the breathing room to do it, then yeah, maybe you could, you could get away with it. But when you're, you're playing on a team, you're being paid a bunch and guys depend on you and you're not making the adjustments for the team. I have very little sympathy, very little. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it is definitely. sad, and I do hope I mean, he gets another job. Yeah, that's what I, I haven't even seen any whispers of. Him. Usually, if a guy gets cut, you know that a team feels can make an impact, they're not a free agent for very long. Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard a peep anywhere about you know someone kicking the tires. Um, and maybe he needs that. Either he's happy with how his career was, and he's down to hang him up, or you know maybe some time to to kind of marinate in the situation that he's in. Maybe the, this is what he needs to realize he needs to make some adjustments mm -hmm. and he'll do that and get picked up somewhere. Yeah, Cause that, you might remember, I, I don't recall who said it, but after he got released, there was someone who came out and said that they basically prepared for him. Like he was a minor league pitcher. Yeah. Position player pitching. Yeah. That's, that's raw. I mean, that just tells you what, where the stuff was. I mean, just was non-existent. Um, yeah, so so maybe he just needs to kind of stew in this and be, okay, I need to make some changes if he wants to keep playing. Otherwise, yeah. you know, he's not gonna if he doesn't make any changes, he's not gonna come back and have success anywhere. Unfortunately, yeah. I'll find a way to 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 get you that article, Tyler, because I mean it it was very eye opening and just the 
the it was very well reported i believe zach buchanan who does a good job with diamondbacks coverage for for the athletic wrote it but it was amazing coverage and um hopefully teams didn't read that article because you know (laughs) probably not ideal (laughs) um yeah but anyways from yeah from one guy yeah speaking of current uh current bad impressions we're gonna switch and we're gonna talk about uh some of the best first impressions that was way better than anything I had in terms of transitions. <laughs> hey, uh, I try to I try to contribute somehow, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, good first impressions, and the reason we bring this up is because the Giants had, and for all you Giants listeners out there, Giants had a a kid come up, Casey Schmidt, their third prospect according to MLB.com, and he kind of set the world on fire. He hit a his first big league home run in his second big league at bat. He's getting multi-hit games left and right. Um, he's hitting at an astronomical pace. Um, so a lot of fun to watch Casey Schmidt debut and, and do well. And it got us thinking, as we always get thinking here on the shutdown inning. What it's all we uh, yeah, what debuts have kind of gotten us excited over the years? Uh guys who have come on the scene and played well right away or I've kind of made an impact otherwise on their team. So do you have one in mind? I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to take the low hanging fruit, man, as a, as a giant fan, you know, Buster Posey. I mean, he had, a, I know he had a cup of coffee in 09, but you know, when he got the call, like you are the catcher. Now we all know what happened in 2010. We know how he performed and, and led the team to their first, you know, championship in San Francisco. Um, and just, it was, crazy to see in person how just immediately it was just even when he was a kid you're like this I feel like he's going to be around for a while he's got that kind of for a, a quiet guy he kind of had that it factor as far as being a leader for the long term as a giant at least for me I felt that with just how he performed in 2010 and how he carried himself and uh so uh, that's the first one that comes to mind when I think of an awesome first impression yeah, that, that that's a good one. And and Posey's a guy like, you know, the common thing when, when like rookies get called up, like it's always like he's starting off great, but soon they're going to figure out a way to pitch him. And like that, we always hear it all the time. We're hearing it with Casey Schmidt, mm-hmm. like soon they're going to expose him. Soon they're going to expose him. And it didn't really happen, the buster, because if I'm not mistaken, didn't he go on a lengthy hitting streak? Who? Sorry, I cut out Posey. for me for a sec. Posey went on a lengthy oh. hitting streak. I believe it was like 21 yeah. games, 22 games yeah. or something like that. Which, yeah, uh, they didn't figure him out. And you could argue they never did because he was always a, a pretty solid hitter. Um, mm. And one of my favorite, just to tie it into like that season specifically, one of my favorite uh, moments of P- Posey in 2010 was actually after the season was already over. Uh, I think it was Kruko I heard tell the story where it was, uh, they were getting ready for the parade. Crook and Kipe were on the elevator with Buster Posey, and they looked over and said, "Enjoy it, kid. It doesn't happen every year." And his response was, "Why not?" You know, so he he was like, "Why can't we do this every year?" And you know, three and five, uh, you know, tells you know, and that's to kind of bring it full circle. That's the winner's mentality, you know, that that you want to have on your as a leader on your team, and and. From the moment he came up, Buster Posey was a leader of the Giants. Absolutely, and a uh, really good start for sure, his rookie year in 2010. Um, so my pick for this one, the one that I always think of, and like I, I thought about Trevor Story a few years ago when he came out of the gate, uh, hitting home run after home run you know, against the Diamondbacks. But Yasiel Puig, who, um, I mean, he burst onto the scene in 2013, in just a monumental way. I remember like he, he debuted and I think he got a few hits or he got a hit in his first game and his first game was topped off. And Kyle Blanks was actually the one that hit the ball, uh, hit a fly <laughs> ball to the, to right field. And we gunned out a guy at first base from the warning track to end the game. Uh, and then after that, he had, you know, multi home run games and he had like a grand slam and then a three run homer in the same game. And, you know, he was just red hot for an entire week. There's a video on YouTube and I advise everybody to go check it out. Yasiel Puig's, I think they use the word incredible, incredible first month in the big leagues, just 
He threw out a guy at third. You know, he just showed everything off that he could do. And he's like one of the most gifted athletes that could have been in, in my mind. Like that guy was, he was built like, you know, an NFL player. He was strong. He had power. He just never really hit, you know, and, and he was a guy who probably wasn't going to age well defensively, but the off the field stuff ruined it for him. And, um, He's probably still around somewhere around the world playing, but kind of a disappointing career for him. But I always think of his debut. Last his I debut. saw, I believe he, yeah, I believe he's playing in Mexico last I saw. Yeah. I don't know if he still is, but that was the most recent I saw. Yeah. But yeah, but I mean, he, yeah. he took baseball by storm, uh, you know, which we, a lot of Giants fans saw, you know, because we played the Dodgers so often back then. We, I hate when people say we, the Giants yeah. played them so often back then. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's funny because like he just became a, a guy that I love to hate after that. Not because I, you know, he's like one of those guys where he was so good so early. I was like, oh, and he, I just can't like this guy. And so, uh, I, I can't say too much nice stuff about him. You know, I, I used to always go to the ball. You know, I, I think I mentioned before, I like to call myself the nice heckler. And so, whenever I was at a game with the Dodgers, I'd always make sure to walk by the arcade and joke around with him a little bit and he acknowledged me a couple times but uh so i'm not going to get too glowing about him i'll leave that to you my friend but hey, he did have, hey, I mean, hey he... yasiel boo <laughs> boo <laughs> <laughs> um well no there, there the one time since since you're saying oh boo boo and i just uh boo. I, w I was walking down the arcade and his uh one of his pockets was hanging out the back of his pants and so I yelled, uh, hey, Puig, you look like an unmade bed out there. Tuck in your pocket. And at first, he kind of was like, hmm? And then finally, he like waited a minute, so it didn't look like he was fully responding to me. And a few uh, a few seconds later, he finally reached back and saw, and he, oh, and he tucked it in. And I was like, see, to see Puig, I would never lie to you. And then he kind of, <laughs> and I was like, and also, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> since i told him i'd never lie to him but uh but that was funny and he kind of like laughed and raised his, his arm up but yeah i mean like you said he is one of those guys where you know if he could have what could have been you know some guys it's fully injuries you know, i know he got banged up a bit but it, it's really unfortunate when most of it's off the field yeah no absolutely and um those were a few that stuck out, and I like the one that you put because we were brainstorming kind of a little bit, and I saw that you put on our doc uh, K Rod. K Rod got right into the World Series. He was like the talk of town in in Anaheim, right? Yeah, I mean, he was he came out of nowhere and he was lights out for the for the Angels, and you know he uh, shout out to uh, to our buddy Andrew who has had this debate with us before on he yeah. thinks K Rod is a definite Hall of Famer. Uh, Andrew Pasquini on vacation international, Mr. Worldwide right now. Um, but you know, he's argue, you know, he's slowly changing my mind. Uh, you know, and the more you look at his career and his longevity, um, he, you know, but yeah, his start though, since that's kind of where we were going from. I mean, anchoring a World Series bullpen is a hell of a way to start a career. Yeah, I I don't know how to judge relievers in the Hall of Fame. It's like if it's not Rivera Hoffman, like it's just like a big like I don't know. And like we're gonna have the same debate with Kenley Jansen. I already see it, and it's like I'm oh, dreading yeah. it. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, Hall of Fame debates are, are always fun, and we'll we'll have that down the uh down the road. Um, and another thing we and Tyler mentioned that uh, he's a nice heckler, and that's definitely part of the ballpark experience, but. We want to talk about, because Tyler and I are actually going to a game, and by the time you see a, another episode of this, I'm sure it would have already happened, and we'll have a lot to talk about. But we're going to a game with a lot of our Giants chatter people um, who are in California. And I figured that we talk about like some of our ballpark, uh, like what we do when when we get to the ballpark, kind of our routine. So I guess, Tyler, for you first, what time do you get there? When do you like eat food and everything? When do you walk around before the game? Tell us all the perks of uh, and all the the your routine of being at a Giants game or being at a baseball game. Yeah, so you know I usually get down there pretty early. That's just something I've always done since I was a kid. You know, I just just being around the ballpark is something I look forward to. Um, and so now I usually you know meet up with some buddies nearby. 
uh, usually for a, a beer or two, because as you'll learn as a 21 year old now, Stephen, beers are a lot cheaper outside of the ballpark than inside the ballpark. Um, and so, you know, there's a, you know, few spots near the ballpark I like to go to, um, uh, local tap, uh, Woodbury, and then of course the public house, uh, shout out to my buddy Chase from my old softball team when I was in the city, who was a bartender there and known to slide an extra beer to my way. But, uh, so, you know, meet up with some buddies, uh, have a, have a, a beer or two, and then just get in the ballpark. I like to get in early. I like to get down near the ballpark. I like to get in early. And I, I do definitely try to do, at least do a lap around the, the, the park um, just to, to take it all in and enjoy it, especially more so now that I'm not in the city. I don't go as often. Um, and then, yeah, at least, at least uh, I try to do it at least once a year. I keep score during the game. That's one of my routines I love mm -hmm. to do just because it it's fun to to me to do. It's kind of relaxing. It's a cool, chill uh, experience at the ballpark. Um, yeah, you know, I, I usually eat pretty much, I try to eat before the game starts since I get in early since you, you brought that up. So get in a little early, grab, you know, some some cha-cha uh, bowl, if you will. And, uh, and then, you know, definitely you know, take part in the seventh inning stretch. Uh, if I'm not keeping score, I usually will go do a lap during the game even as well. And then, uh, you know, I'm notorious for not leaving a game. Uh, it's some of my history. And so I, I never leave a game early. Uh, uh, if I have any say in it, it's happened very few times. And so I'm there, I'm there till the end. And so that's my, uh, from beginning to end, that's what I'm up to. Yeah, no, that's that's seems like a very normal like baseball routine. I like the keeping score part about that. I actually didn't know that uh, that's one of your your yearly go tos. Uh, for me, it's like a little different, and obviously, you know, with SF Bay and everything, and what I do when I cover games, it's a lot different. It's a, it's a little different for me. Yeah, the press box. yeah. We don't have to get into that, but if I'm going as a fan, um, I. At least when I was a kid, I used to love being the first. Like, I like being the first one anywhere. Or maybe not the first one, but I like being early anywhere. And in this case, I loved being able to go and go to BP and watch mm -hmm. BP. And the thing that I don't like what Major League Baseball has done, and maybe it's not Major League Baseball, maybe it's the teams, is that like BP should be an event in itself. I've always been an advocate of that. Like it should be like the home team should not be wrapping up when the gates open. Uh, I see it all the time and it, it's just, it, it's not something that should be happening. Like it should be a, an event in itself. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, yeah, I've always loved BP. I didn't want to cut into your routine, but mm -hmm. when you brought up BP, I was going to try to circle back on this after and then and you kind of went there, mm -hmm. you know, BP should be an event. It's such an engaging time for fans with the team and just to uh, get more baseball instead of wrapping it up. And then you have like an hour of nothing happening before there's any more baseball activity. And it, it, it is unfortunate that, you know, like you said, the home team's always wrapping up, you know, they, they should flip it, but I know they probably don't do that so that the visiting team doesn't have to get there as early since they're on the road so they can spend some more time in mm -hmm. their hotels or whatever but I, they could definitely even just push everything back even if it's like 10 minutes just give give the fans some more i think that would be awesome yeah and i don't think it's like a devilish reason on why they don't have it open like i don't think it's like any like you know maybe they just want their guys to hit without any anything going on too much and um, but if it's for a reason, like, you know, we don't want to lose too many baseballs to fans, like the balls that are in the ball that are, you know, get crushed into the bleachers. Like those aren't being reused again. Let's be honest. Who picks them up? The ushers. Yeah. They're not throwing them back on the field for the guys to, you know, so I think it would be cool for, for, you know, people to go with their gloves and have a good time. Yeah. But yep. And, and so uh, after BP, what, what are you doing, man? In that hour downtime yeah. I mentioned, what, what's Steven do? Probably eating, probably eating, but I also always like, you know, whatever I always used to like what they have on the scoreboard too. Like I like the pregame stuff. I like getting in the vibe mm -hmm. of a baseball game and you know, there's pregame trivia on the scoreboard. That's always fun. But yeah, like you, I like to take a, a lap around. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I like my go-tos at the moment, bacon wrapped hot dogs, uh, and they're better outside the park, way better outside the park. Sometimes I'll get them in the park. Sometimes I'll get garlic fries. Sometimes I'll get chicken tenders. Although Oracle park chicken tenders have been on a like three year hiatus. Uh, everybody that, uh, all the diehards know that, um, and hopefully they come back soon. Um, and I don't like to, and if I'm meeting someone at the game and are saying, or I'm saying hi to someone, I want to do it before the game. Cause during the game, oh, I'm in definitely. my seat. I want to watch the game during the game. Um, yeah. Like if you're not, unless you're like in the same section that one of you has to get up and walk 15 minutes to get, especially to now. The yeah. With yeah. The now that's like an inning and a half now. Yeah. Very quick story time. Super quick. I know I, I, use the a lot of time with the bp thing but uh, we went to a game in sf state uh it was sf state night at the ballpark and we i I went to go get food and everything and by the time i got back up to my seat and you know somebody else wanted food so i had to get them food um by the time i got up to my seat i had missed two innings and like this is a you know something that we kind of knew what happened with the new pitch clock, but still it was like, wow, I experienced that firsthand and the Dodgers had put runs on the board already. And it was a weird experience missing, missing like that. And at that point you got to rely on the TVs as you're walking the concourse and everything. And it's a very strange uh, experience, but yeah, like you, I stay, I try to stay until the final out. Um, And I think it's worth, you know, waiting in traffic. You know, I'd say so. Uh, cause you don't want to miss anything. So, yeah. I mean, and now anyway, to, to beat traffic, you'd have to leave in like the seventh inning because yeah. of how quick the game can wrap up. So you might as well stay and enjoy that ball game, you know? Yeah. Stay and enjoy the ball game. And if you really want to avoid the traffic, like take pictures after the game or something, you know, pose for pictures, you know, in front of the empty field. And by the time you get out, it will be fine. And plus, you know, attendance numbers around baseball. I don't know what they look like everywhere, but in some places you could get away with it. <laughs> Oakland. <laughs> um, but uh, I want to go to an A's game. I do. Cause I think I oh, would yeah. have a great chance at getting a, a souvenir. That's true. I, I have never caught, uh, you know, or gotten a live game ball. So maybe, maybe that's the angle. Yeah. And, and I hate to like give money to those people, but I think I would do it to to try and get a ball and plus i've never been to an empty stadium when a baseball game's going on so just to experience it in in a bad way (laughs) yeah but uh yeah so you know that's that's our routine let us know what your routine is you know what what are we doing wrong or or what's 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 something that you enjoy every time you go to the ballpark um and another ballpark routine, and I know where you're going to go with this one. You put it on the agenda, yay or nay for ballpark proposals. So this ballpark routine, Stephen, I'm, I'm just going to give you the floor because I know where we're going. I am a nay on the ballpark proposal. So absolute nay. And like people are starting to mention me whenever it does happen. And it seems like every night when I'm covering a game, it does happen. Somebody proposes at the ballpark. And I think about the effort that goes into it. Uh, And it's, you know, it's great. Anytime someone's getting married, it's great. You know, you do you. But in a public setting like that, like, I want to see a no so bad. I want to see a rejection so bad. And again, I believe in love 100%. But I don't think the ballpark is, and again, none of my business. On this episode of Shutdown Inning, Steven Risotto doesn't believe in love. Yeah, I guess that's the angle we're taking. No, but I, I see like there's got to be another place to like in, in front of everybody that you don't know, and you know I, there's I mean, a lot of times yeah, where it, I feel it, like the the I, a lot of times I feel like the person getting proposed to probably is embarrassed and they feel pressured to I don't know it seems like a a, a not easy way out of no that's not right my reasoning behind this is just that I don't like it. You know, and I guess that is not yeah, good. I mean, I mean, it used to not be as frequent, but yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, like I don't remember the last game I was at that didn't have one. Yeah. I mean, I agree. You know, there's definitely some more, you know, intimate settings to have a proposal. So it's definitely just like a look at me moment, I feel like. And it's just kind of overplayed now. Back when it was just like, oh, maybe you see it a couple of times a year. It's like, oh, that's cool. 
but when it's happening like every time it's like okay like it's kind of it's overplayed for me I mean if that's what you want to do and that's how you want to propose like cool it's just I'm, I don't really care about it anymore when I'm at the ballpark and I see it yeah that's probably a good point like you know it's overused at this point and I would have more respect for somebody that proposes in like a meaningful like not saying Oracle Park like somebody could easily have a bond with baseball with someone else and that could be a very romantic thing but like what about you take her to like you know your you, to a Brazilian you... steakhouse <laughs> Or where you first uh, met, like, you know, your, your first, like a nice restaurant or like a park. I mean, there's, that's where you, I proposed. I proposed at the place we first met. See, there's a backstory behind that and it's original. It's something you came up with. Um, but I don't know. And yeah. there's a wedding at but, Oracle park. Uh, and I dig that actually. I think there's, you know, I, I, I don't mind that actually. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, because it's not like in front of the cameras and in front of a crowd and people you don't know. So, you know, if you want to rent out a ballpark for a wedding or an engagement party, if you're uh, Kim and Kanye, yeah. uh, you know, then then go for it. But I mean, the most ballpark routines are on the on the big screen. But I feel like we have to mention the the ballpark uh, proposal that uh, happened earlier this year, where the guy at Dodger Stadium, instead of doing it on the big screen, he ran onto the field in the center field and got absolutely trucked by the security guard as he was pulling the ring out. I mean, it's a good way to end up in jail, but at least he was creative with it. Yes. That guy is a winner. That guy is somebody who should be awarded for his efforts for, you know, yes, he proposed at a ballpark, but he, like you mentioned the word creative, he did it in a creative way and he tried to reinvent the wheel and i respect him for it okay i respect <laughs> i respect the effort that is top notch creativity and did he deserve I just think to get it's taken awesome out? that i just yeah. think it's awesome that the the ballpark proposal that you're okay with is with them ending up in jail yes it's a risk take it's taking a risk and like how about the ones where like it says on the scoreboard will you marry me and there's like say say the word i'd almost i'd almost rather do that than just make us all watch it at least it's just like you know it's not like a look at me moment like the only people that know that it's them is probably just them there together and then he's i'm sure they're proposing and holding a ring and stuff i'd rather yeah. go that route instead of make us all watch it and pretend like you're original that's fair yeah and a bunch of strangers around and, and by the way the guy that got trucked by the dodger stadium security guard like if we're security guard, do we need to truck him in that situation? Like, I know I'm like I'm sticking up for the guy here, but like, is a I, I think you have blown... to. You gotta. I mean, what do you do? Just walk up and tap him on the shoulder. I think security he's not guards moving. Get, he's security guards knee. get embarrassed so much by guys like avoiding them and running on the field forever that you know I want they, let them take that shot because that guy's <laughs> he's he's in the play stupid games win stupid prizes department at that point and so let them get their licks in and when they're instead of getting like made a fool of the guy's in a position where he's not moving he doesn't pose a threat to anybody he's not gonna go he's literally on his knee not moving and we got a security guy coming at full force full sprint trucks him is that he's really trained necessary? his whole life he's trained his whole life for that moment Steve. yeah Punish him for being on the field. I agree with that. Rules are rules. But does he need to be, like, possibly injured? Like, that could have Probably been a dislocated... not. Probably not. I'm just joking. But, like, yeah. I mean, I don't know if he had to go, like, full speed into the guy. But <laughs> we're looking at, like, a dislocated clavicle right there. I mean, that was <laughs> full speed. The guy wasn't moving, for Christ's sake. That sake. guy's on the Dodgers IL right now, too. Yeah, hamstring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's that's an unfortunate situation, but, but yeah, kudos to that guy. <laughs> kudos to the guy that went to jail. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, so you know, we've uh started this trend three up, three down of the shutdown inning, and so for uh for this episode, we'll start with the three up. So that is Mr. Risotto. Yes, and Ronald Acuna Jr. is my first up and Ronald Acuna Jr. is somebody that I noticed has been left off a few like top, you know, top lists in terms of players in the game. And a lot of it had to do with the injury. He was coming off an injury in, in 2021. 
Um, and last year kind of like wasn't exactly the Ronald Acuna we're used to seeing. Um, he played in 119 games, 15 homers, 50 RBIs, um, and a 112 OPS plus. So just, you know, a little bit above average offensively, but it wasn't the Ronald Acuna that we know this year. He is doing so much damage. He leads the National League in runs scored. He leads the league in stolen bases. And he's always a perennial 40-40 guy. He got close in 2019 when he hit 41 homers and then stole 37 bags. He could be a 40-40 guy this year. So, I mean, I hope to see it. Guys like him need to be healthy all the time. He's an exciting player. He's an international star. uh, And he's leading the national league in pretty much OPS or uh, sorry, on base percentage and OPS. And um, he's putting himself in the conversation for national league MVP. So I wanted to give him a hats off. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And uh, just, I don't want to get stuck on it for too long, but he had that play the other night where uh, he was on first base. There was a walk. He ran to second and then noticed that, you know, the shortstop has been playing up the middle third baseman had been playing closer to short and neither of them were looking at him. So he just hit, got to second and then turned on the jets and took third too. And I just love to see heads up baseball uh, like that. And, you know, he's just so fun to watch uh, so much energy. And like, like you said, he's one of those guys you hope is always healthy because he's so amazing for baseball. And so definitely agree with that uh, first up. Yes. And my second up uh, two strikeout accomplishments that need to be noted Garrett Cole recorded his 2000th career strikeout. Congratulations to Garrett Cole. I've always liked him. Uh, I think he gets a lot of interesting hate because he is a Yankee. I do feel that. Uh, but he's you know been a workhorse throughout his career and been relatively reliable. I know maybe not to New York, New York standards. I feel like the Yankees fans have not felt like he has broken out just yet. But he is an ace. He's perennially one of the best pitchers in baseball. And congrats to him on getting strikeout 2,000. And then uh, here's an interesting strikeout anecdote. Zach Granke became the fifth Major League Baseball pitcher to strike out at least 1,000 different players. This is pretty incredible, actually. Um, You know, anytime you're the fifth person in history to do something involving strikeouts it's pretty significant and Granky gets forgotten about quite a bit when it comes to like active guys that could be in for Cooperstown um and maybe he deserves another look I don't know if he's in or not but just some a pair of uh of strikeout accomplishments that I wanted to recognize yeah I mean uh I do agree Cole probably does get a lot of hate for being in, in pinstripes uh, but yeah, on Granky, I mean, like you said, he's the, the fifth ever, uh, and especially with strikeouts, with pitchers not pitching as much nowadays and longer rotations, when you see guys, you know, hitting these milestones now, it's even more impressive. And so just to touch really quick, he said the fifth ever, the other four, Nolan Ryan, Randy Johnson, Greg Maddox, and Roger Clemens. And so I I would probably put Granky in the Hall of Fame. I know you said he's, uh, you're not sure at this point, but I would probably give him my vote because he's just been kind of an under the radar guy. He's got a Cy Young, uh, but he's always quietly been one of the top pitchers in the league. Yeah, and uh, all time in strikeouts, he is 20th in the history of baseball. And uh, maybe I, I don't I don't know the people directly in front of him, but maybe he moves up into that list. Uh, we shall see. And then my third. Uh, up for shutdown, uh, three up, three down is a pair of managers. The first one I want to mention really quickly, his team is not doing good, but I want to give props to Mark Kotze for being a soldier here. He has nothing to work with practically. Shout out to that kid Ruiz in center field. He seems to be good, and so does Brent Rooker. But Mark Kotze has nothing to, to work with, really. And at some point, somewhere down the line he's going to be a scapegoat and he's going to lose his job it's inevitable that he will not be in vegas but he he does nothing to work with and he is in the trenches still and i want to give him some encouragement you're doing a great job mark it's not your fault uh and then also bruce bochi who his luck is kind of reversed his first place rangers uh are playing really well they have a deep offense they have a good pitching staff uh and boch you know, came back to do exactly what he's doing now. And that is win baseball games. And I don't think he would have come back if he wasn't in a position to where he could win. So 
managers that uh, need to get credit, but um, are kind of on completely different ends of the spectrum. Yeah, I mean, not not to. Uh, yeah, definitely. So, and and you know, more to touch on the positive side and the and the boat side because he's you know a favorite uh, for me is. I'm not surprised to see the Rangers doing well. I'm not surprised that their pitching has improved greatly. And uh, I'm, I just love looking at numbers and stuff. And I, uh, you know, I know run differential isn't everything, but the Rangers now, they finally passed the Rays. They have the best run differential in baseball under Bochy. And so, you know, I think a lot of that is the the pitching performing a little bit better. Uh, the offense has always been pretty solid and, and I'm not surprised to see him having this success down in Texas. Absolutely. What about you? You got the down. You got a tough assignment, downs this week. Yeah, always always tough to have to look for for negativity. But uh, down number one, I'm have to go with Hunter Dozier, who was just DFA'd by the Kansas City Royals. Uh, he had signed a, an extension a few years back, and he was just struck. He's hasn't really been himself since that that early breakout stretch in his career. But I mean, this year he's hitting. A, he was hitting a buck eighty three, two bombs. Uh, and he just w- wasn't performing. And I think with where Kansas City is, they need to see who the who they have, you know, with their kids. And can't have a guy basically eating a roster spot if you want to evaluate what you have going. And so he was DFA'd. So he is down number one for me. Yeah, I mean, a guy that the Royals thought would be a part of their rebuild, and it just didn't work out. I mean, they gave him that extension, hoping that he would be a key part in their offense, but. Um... Yeah, anytime you get DFA'd, that's that's going to be a down and and a guy of of his caliber. And I think maybe he gets a shot down the road with the team. Uh, I know every team kind of goes through that phase where it's like, yeah. oh, this guy just got released. Maybe they're going to give him a chance. So uh, yeah. hopefully uh, he he does well somewhere else. Change of scenery is always good. Yep, definitely. And um, yeah, I'm sure someone will kind of opposite of Bumgarner like I talked about earlier. I haven't, you know, I think Dozier's a guy who will get sweeped up pretty quick by somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, down number two, I'm going to have to go with John Schneider, manager of the Toronto Blue Jays. As, as Stephen and I called it a little earlier uh, before we started recording, he quote unquote pulled a Mattingly, uh, visited the mound twice, and uh, Alex Manoa had to be pulled from the game. And uh, you know, something that I, I was aware of, but you had pointed it out to me. Do you want to give the little funny twist to this, Stephen? Yeah, so Don Mattingly did this. We remember it as Giants people in 2010, and Bruce Bochy caught it when he was the Dodger. And Don Mattingly was not yet the Dodger manager, um, but he was a coach filling in for an ejected manager at the time, Joe Torre. And we remember it as the Mattingly, uh, the Mattingly move or whatever. And now Don Mattingly is the bench coach for John Schneider. So that's the kind of the funny twist there. Yep, the, the influence is real. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Just kind of, uh, you know, it's, at least this is kind of just like a goofy incident. It's not like a over, like this guy is struggling, but you got to gotta give the the manager, uh, the skipper a down. if he's They had to have talked about twice. it, though. It's like, yeah, I did that once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, don't worry about it, man. Happens to the best of us. <laughs> um, and then down number three, I'm going to have to go with the San Diego Padres. You know, we talked earlier that there are uh, several teams that are underperforming, but I feel like uh, – Aside from maybe the Cardinals, the Padres are definitely the most surprising. Uh, You know, they're underperforming yet again, kind of across the board and obviously in the standings. And it just seems like every year we've said, you know, all right, is this the year the Padres do it? Is this the year the Padres do it? And I, in our preseason predictions, I said, this is the year the Padres do it. And so far, you know, still, you know, about a third of the way through the season, looking like this isn't the year they do it yet. Yeah, I, and I know Juan Soto's heated up as of late, but they got guys like playing out of position. It's not going well for them. And if and it, the most troubling thing for them, and I'm looking at everything right here, and here are the uh, least amount of runs scored in baseball. So we got the Tigers at number thirty. I'm going down now. Tigers, Guardians, Marlins, A's. Okay, so pretty rough teams right there in terms of offense. And then number twenty sixth in runs scored is the San Diego Padres. So that backs up your point about them being disappointed. Pretty rough. Yeah, I mean, if anything, if you're in the, yeah, if you're in the Padres clubhouse, obviously, okay, we, you know, with their offensive lineup, there's no way they should be, they should be in the top five or six on that list, not the bottom. 
And so if you're in the clubhouse, I'm sure you're, you know, saying, okay, we're, we're not this bad. We're going to click eventually and turn it around. And if you're the rest of baseball, you're just hoping that they don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I mean, I mean, that is rough. And, and I do real quick. I was just thinking about some like honorable mentions for the downs. Herman Marquez for being suspended for the sticky stuff. Um, shout out to him. And also Trevor Bauer got sent down in Japan to the minor leagues in Japan and got lit up in his first outing in the minor leagues facing minor league Japan hitters. So I would put that as an up personally. Ah, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you love to see it. Yeah. It's but, a down yeah. for him, but it's an up for the rest of the baseball. Oh, Zach Campbell down too. Oh gosh. Yeah. He's don't get, we shouldn't get, maybe we can do a whole segment on that guy sometime. We, I want to get we into should. that guy right now. We should get him on the show. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's get him <laughs> on the show and then talk about him to his face. No, we won't do that, but we will get into this. One of these days we will get into Zach Campbell as a topic on its own. Cause there's a lot to get into, but anyways, I think we shut it down again. <laughs> we did it, you know, three up, three down. We're on a roll, man. We are on a roll, and uh, we promise a guest soon. I know everybody out there has been waiting at the edge of their seats, but the stars will align, and we will finally get that long-awaited guest. Um, and it could be somebody that uh, – it will be somebody that's very interesting. I can guarantee you that. Absolutely. Well, uh, anyways, thank you, everybody, for listening. It was a blast, and um, I am off for the summer, so my schedule opens up. I know <laughs> Tyler is somebody that's yeah. – uh, available quite a bit too um and uh we'll be back with some regular episodes thank you all for listening go follow us on twitter at shutdown underscore inning um and then of course everywhere you find your your podcast and uh also youtube uh so go 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 check us out there and uh, i didn't say rizzo cast i know <laughs> tyler's laughing but go listen to it yeah go listen to that too while you're at it Giants chatter, all that fun stuff, everything we're associated with. Uh, so go check us out, and uh, we will see you next time. That's what's up.